So how do we decide whether something is true or not? The media shapes what we believe about the world in powerful ways. Think about climate change, COVID-19, immigration. What, much of what we know about these topics is communicated to us uh, through the media, through language, metaphors, narratives, images. Billions of people now have access to online networks where they share news within the split of a second. And a lot of that news isn't necessarily accurate. Um, so while once it took a news story to travel from person to person and city to city and maybe took weeks or months uh, for a rumor to travel, now people are exposed to lies and falsehoods um, around the world within uh, a matter of seconds. And I think that's the power of social media that we need to be carefully thinking about in terms of how to address this issue. So how do we decide whether something is true or not? One interesting mechanism that the brain uses to decide whether or not something is true is something we call fluency. Fluency has to do with how familiar something is. So the more you hear something, the more it's repeated, the more familiar it becomes and the more likely the brain is to think it's true because it uses fluency as a signal for truth. So often when we talk about fake news and disinformation, we talk about elections. You know, has fake news disrupted the presidential election in the United States? Has it caused Brexit? Those are very difficult questions to answer because we're looking for a direct causal link between the news that people read and their voting behavior, which is very complex. But people often forget that there's also indirect consequences of the spread of fake news. And one of those indirect consequences is that it harms trust in democracy, trust in media, and trust in institutions. One of the biggest fake news campaigns of all time occurred during World War II. Nazi Germany printed leaflets, booklets, there were paintings outside of shops, uh, cartoons, and their whole education system was geared towards brainwashing people. And lots of studies have documented the influence of that campaign on how people think about other groups in society, even until this present day. So my own interest is in the psychology of persuasion and influence. How do people become persuaded of information? And one day I was sitting in the library of the university and I was reading an article from the 1960s by a psychologist named Bill McGuire. And he was writing about ways to actually help people resist influence when they don't want it. And he was talking about how everyone's obsessed with influencing each other, but in fact uh, there's almost no program of research that looks at how to help people resist unwanted attempts to persuade them. So that's where my interest is in helping people resist persuasion when they don't want it. So our current measures often revolve around debunking and fact checking. We're trying to undo the damage when it's already done. And we know from lots of research in cognitive science that it's very difficult to correct information once people have already been exposed to a falsehood. And this is what we call the continued influence of misinformation. Once you're exposed to a falsehood, it settles in your memory. It makes friends with other things that you know to be true. And people tend to retrieve false info from their memory even when they acknowledge a correction. And so pre-bunking, trying to preemptively protect people before that damage occurs, is much more effective than debunking. So what the media described as a psychological vaccine against fake news is really based on the psychological theory of inoculation. So just as injecting yourself with a weakened dose of a virus triggers the production of antibodies to help protect you from future infection, you can do the same with information. By preemptively injecting people with a severely weakened dose of fake news or with an example of the techniques that are used to manipulate people, people can build up cognitive antibodies or intellectual antibodies against misinformation and become more resistant to it when they're targeted in the real world. So to translate our theoretical findings into real world interventions, such as the games that we've developed, we've teamed up with organizations, governments, and social media companies around the world. An example of which is Go Viral, our intervention that helps people spot fake news about COVID-19, which we developed together with the Cabinet Office here in the United Kingdom, and with assistance from the World Health Organization and the United Nations Verified Campaign, who together helped identify audiences that are vulnerable to fake news about COVID-19, so that we can actually get this intervention out to those who need it the most. One of the things we did was we teamed up with the gaming company and we created a game called Bad News. 
And bad news is a simulation. It simulates a social media feed and it gives users a taste of what it's like to spread misinformation by engaging with weakened doses of the techniques that are used to deceive people. And these techniques include things like polarization and conspiracy theories and impersonating other people online like fake experts. And what we found in our research is that when people go through our interventions, they become better at spotting fake news, they become more confident in their own ability to discern fact from fiction, and they report to share less fake news with people in their network. Now, of course, with any vaccine, it wears off over time. So when we follow up with people month after month, week after week, what we find is that we can maintain a certain level of immunity if people get regular booster shots. But for me, the ultimate benefit of the metaphor uh, lies in herd immunity. What we want to do is have enough people vaccinated so that misinformation won't have a chance to spread uh, in online networks. And the way to do that is to actually try to find out what level of vaccination coverage do we need at a psychological level. And we can do that with computer simulations, for example, to try to predict when herd immunity might emerge and what needs to be done in order to achieve that. So when we look to the future of disinformation and fake news, I think the viral analogy is helpful. Just as viruses mutate over time and become more infectious and more harmful, the same is true for disinformation. The techniques are becoming more advanced. The dark arts of manipulation are evolving. So as Cambridge has informally dubbed me the defense against the dark arts teacher, I can only quote my colleague from Harry Potter, Professor Severus Snape, when he said, our defenses must therefore be as flexible and inventive as the arts that we seek to undo. Is it not hard for democracy to collapse? All you have to do is nothing.